Okay, so we are really lucky to have Guy Royce with us tonight. Um, as he mentioned, it is JavaScript. Apparently, doesn't know the difference between JavaScript and Java. I know both kinds. Yeah. <laughs> but he only knows JavaScript and the other language is COBOL, so I thought JavaScript was better than COBOL. Absolutely so. <laughs> um, so he's going to talk to us about vectors today. Uh, I do want to thank Manifest for providing dinner and the cake. And uh, we have some door prizes at the end, so stay around so you can win a door prize. Uh, about half of you will win a door prize. So <laughs> good reason to stick around. And I don't think I have any other announcements yet right now, so I'll hand it over to Guy. Thank you, Chris. So uh, I'll probably end up for most of this talk. I'm breaking like two cardinal rules of pres presenting tonight. One is I don't have any slides. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the topic, and then I'm going to show code. Um, so I, that, that's the first rule I've broken. I don't have any slides. It's, it's going to be pure code. That's kind of a win in, in, in some ways. But, the other, but the, because it's a lot of code, uh, I probably would be sitting down behind my screen a fair bit while I'm, I'm doing that because my computer's down there. And if I bend over, then you know no one wants to see that. <laughs> so um, and uh, so yeah. Uh, and I don't have, uh, I will uh, say up front that I've given this presentation once. What I've really done is I've built an application uh, that does a silly and stupid thing. It finds Bigfoot using AI. Um, and I wrote this as a, a sample project to show how uh, we can use my uh, company's product, Redis. I, who's heard of Redis here? A few of you? Excellent. Um, Redis is an in memory NoSQL database. It has a vector search capability. So I'm using the vector search capability, loading it up with a bunch of Bigfoot sightings, and then you can search for those Bigfoot sightings. It is a stupid and silly thing, but it's actually not as stupid and silly as it sounds because it's exactly the kind of thing you might want to do with your documents. They just wouldn't be necessarily be about Bigfoot sightings. They might be something more relevant, like insurance claims or police reports or doctor's reports or something like that, where you want to be able to search for things semantically. So that's what I have built. We'll show you the code in a bit, but I want to level set uh, some, uh, get everyone on the page here in terms of like vectors and embeddings and AI and chat GPT and all this stuff. We've all heard all the hype around AI. We've probably, every single one of us has gone to chat GPT and asked it ridiculous questions and gotten ridiculous answers, asked the questions we, thought would be hard and it figured out. We, you know, you ask it a lot of questions and it's surprisingly good. Um, but how does this stuff work? Well, we're not going to get into the chat DPT aspect of that. That's transformer architecture and stuff. And frankly, I don't understand it. I, I know this. Uh, I put things in and it gives responses back. I understand what a token is, but it's not something I've used a lot. Um, in terms of, it's not something I've coded a lot. I've used ChatGPT a ton, we all have. So um, what I want to talk about is, uh, is what's a vector database. Before I talk about what a vector database is, I want to talk about what an embedding is. And so an embedding is probably, I think it's probably the key concept to make sense of the vector database, why, why you would care about a vector database. So the idea of an embedding is that it uses an AI model, like an LLM, to turn data into something that is contains the semantic representation of that thing. That sounds fancy, but it's really, it understands what it is. It understands the context of it. So you can give it, say, a document, a bunch of text, and it will understand what that text is about, and will create an embedding. You can give it an image, and it will turn that into an embedding. You can give it audio information, it will turn that into a embedding. And it will, it will look at what's in the picture, and if there's a picture of a cat, then it will have semantic information saying there's a cat in here. If it has a picture of a tiger, that's like a cat. It understands that tigers are kind of like cats, they're a type of cat. It's a big cat. Um, and it understands more uh, abstract concepts, like you give it a picture of an animal, but, you know, it will find other pictures of animals in it. And the idea here is that the, the, the context is in there. This, this shows up really good in my Bigfoot example because I've got all these Bigfoot sightings. 
and they all have this text to say things like, uh, I saw Bigfoot while I was hunting down in Wayne National Forest, and he snuck up on us and that sort of stuff. Or uh, you'll have a Bigfoot sighting where, um, ah, sorry, my computer went into power save mode. It's not. I don't want it to do this. Is this is this still shared? Hope so. I think you need, think you need to reshare. I don't see your screen. Okay. Share. There we go. Entire screen. There we go again. Wow. Come on. There we go. There we go. We should be back now. Yes. So, so what, so what these models, these models that do embeddings do is they create embeddings. I defined a thing with a thing. That's always a bad point. <laughs> um, but that embedding is that thing that stores that sort of semantic meaning of what's in the thing that the embedding was created off of. So, if you give it text about a Bigfoot sighting in uh, near uh, Lake Hope. In winter, it knows that the lake. It knows what Lake Hope is. It knows what a lake is. It knows that a lake is a body of water. And so then you can interrogate those embeddings and say, "Give me another embedding." Uh, I'm not explaining this well. Let me go down another level. So, so it creates this embedding and encodes that semantic idea behind the, the things that are in it. And then the uh, a vector is actually just an embedding. Embeddings are vectors, not all vectors are embeddings. This is a, uh, think of the vectors, it's a multi-dimensional array. So lots of, lots of dimensional arrays, right? Like 100 dimensions, 20 dimensions, whatever. It's kind of metadata. Hmm? It's kind of metadata. Kind of, it's more, so the, the, the vector, the embedding, which is a vector. So an embedding is just a vector. The vector puts similar concepts next to each other numerically in it. So if you've got a text that is about a Bigfoot sighting that happens near a lake, then there will be numbers in like the top right corner of that vector that represent the idea that that is near water, near a lake. And then if you create another embedding, which is a vector from another bit of text, then that will have the same numbers and similar numbers in similar positions. So you get, uh, you can take big complex data like images and audio and text and turn them into embeddings, which are vectors. So does it and, have a behind the scenes uh, chat GPT or LLM behind it to understand get the semantic? How does that make a semantic? That, that's, what, that, that's, that's the magic of the model. So the, uh, the embedders are, are what's doing that. They create that embedding and they're using transformers to do that behind the scenes. Uh, so. And again, I don't necessarily understand how they do that internally. I know that I can call them, get things, and get these embeddings out. And this will be a lot easier once I show it. So, but that's the idea behind the vector. Is it's just if you just think of it like take a simplified two-dimensional array because it's easy to visualize. And if I um, embed the word cat, or I got text that mentions a cat then cat might be up here. Tiger might be right here. Animals in this area. And so if I search for show me pictures that have, uh, show me text that, that talks about animals, well, it knows that a cat is an animal, it knows that a tiger is an animal, and anything that's got numbers in that top right corner of it that are of similar values are going to be about animals. And if I ask for a cat, it will know a more narrow range of numbers. So it, it creates these things and it does it in a fairly consistent fashion. So if I've got, it understands the context. So if I give it text or an image that has these things in it, it'll always put them in the same place. But it'll put related concepts, particularly with text. This is something that really struck me with the Bigfoot stuff. I went searching for things that give me Bigfoot sightings near a in, that happened in the desert. And then I would look at the text that we used to generate that embedding. The word desert never showed up in it. It mentioned arroyos and washes and cacti and all these things that are associated with the desert, but it never used the word desert, and yet it still found it. And that's because 
all these de desert things are over here in this part of the vector. And so LLM creates embedding. Embedding is just a vector, it's just an array. So what's a vector database? A vector database is just a database that has a, a column or a field that contains one that can hold a vector. And we usually they're stored as some sort of a blob, some sort of binary object. In the case of Redis, it's stored as a uh, just as a protobuf, just a bunch of 16-bit floats. And uh, what the vector search capability in a vector database does is it actually doesn't do any artificial intelligence. The, the embedder has done that already. That's where the AI happens. What the vector database is doing is applying brute force algorithms and saying, how similar are these vectors? Because all it has to do is look at them and say, these numbers are in the same place and they're around the same value as over here. So how much do these vectors, these two vectors overlap? You can build an index off of that and then you can search off of it. There's several ways to do that. Um, frankly, they are um, things that I can parrot the words. <laughs> uh, there's a, like a cosine similarity where you're not so worried at far, how far into the, you start like the origin in the middle of the vector. And if it's in the same, at the same angle, then it's a similar concept because all these concepts will be at the same, on the same line. And so animal might be down here, but you know, over here it might be tiger. It doesn't care about how deep it goes. It just cares about the direction. And then you can take a vector and say, I'm, you know, it's got numbers over here, it's got numbers over here, and you measure the angle and how the, basically the shorter the angle, the more similar they are. Uh, there's lots of ways to do it. There's lots of algorithms. Moving fast, there will be more algorithms. But the key thing that it does is it's looking at that vector and it's just comparing it to other vectors. And so you can use this to search. What you can do is you can make an embedding and store that embedding, that vector for every single database entry that you have. You got a document associated with it. And then when someone wants to search, well, they can type their search terms in and you can create embedding off of those search terms. And then you're just matching the search term embedding versus all the embeddings that are in the database. Does that make sense? Can I say embedding and vector more? <laughs> so now um, I, I, I built this little demo application and, and I, I had a couple of goals here. One was I wanted to show that you didn't have to do it with Python. And so I used JavaScript. Another thing that I wanted to show is that you didn't have to plop down a credit card to use uh, OpenAI, that you could just do this with local models. And so I have a local model running on my MacBook right here, which will uh, do the embedding. And, um, you know, of course, I wanted to show off Redis. I, I work there. <laughs> so uh, I, I wanted to show off the vector search capabilities of Redis, but the, these concepts are applicable to other vector databases as well. Um, but I, I just wanted to make it really accessible in a, in a friendly language, running locally, not needing a credit card, so that you can just literally clone this, run it, and go. I'm sorry? Uh, it's okay. <laughs> Did we call you out? Yeah. So, but when you need to generate a response, you still need to call the over No. No? My yes. model was running on my MacBook. Okay. And this is an Intel MacBook with 32 gigs of RAM. <laughs> so it's dog ass slow. <laughs> yeah. So, does it have GPU? Like, do you need to have GPUs or something? Uh, I am using, I'm actually doing it with the CPU, mm -hmm. uh, which on my MacBook is a little slow. So uh, I had a, a specific problem. So I needed to use uh, two models. So the embedders often have a token limit, the number of token being roughly the number of words in the document, but it could also be punctuation and portions of words. Like, um, like suboptimal is kind of really two tokens because the concept of sub and the con concept of optimal. Um, but the... Uh, the, some of the embedders have token limits. The one I was using had a token limit of 512 tokens. So basically five, about 500 words. Uh, Mac, uh, what CPU is? Uh, is that the uh, AMD or the M1 chip? It's AMD. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's Intel. Okay. Uh, Intel with, uh, I got an AMD GPU, which the library I'm using doesn't know how to use. So it, it's actually running on, on CPU. So, um, so because I needed to get that down from to 512 tokens, 
I first took the Bigfoot sightings in my data set, and I had to run them through an LLM and tell the instructor to summarize them. And so I'm running a Mistral 7B LLM locally on my MacBook. And so that seven, Mistral is just one of the LLMs that's out there. 7B means there are 7 billion hyperparameters. So if you think about a neural network, we've all seen the picture of a neural network where it's a circles with a bunch of lines and another layer of circles. That 7B is the number of lines, 7 billion lines, the weights on all those lines. So that's 7 billion 16-bit floating point numbers. So 14 gigs of RAM. <laughs> that is the model. I would, I would bring that model, load that model up. I give it the text of the Bigfoot sighting with the instructions to please summarize this to less than 500 words. You are a help, I get to tell you're a helpful assistant. You summarize Bigfoot sightings for use for creating a, you know, a vector for embedding for a vector database. Please summarize this. And then it does. It's actually really kind of fun how it summarizes it because uh, if you give it too short of a Bigfoot sighting, it will inflate it. And it reads like a, a middle school student trying to make their essay be exactly 500 words long. <laughs> so, uh, which is kind of funny. But so then I use an L on the summary. So that's the thing that's slow on my Mac. That takes about 90 seconds for me to process one of those. Um, creating the embedding from the, that uh, summarized uh, Bigfoot sighting, take, I don't notice the time that it takes. And then I do that. Then and so then I you know I would go through that process, shove them all in Redis. And when I uh, when it's time to query, then I take your query and I run it through that same embedder, which happens very quickly, and then just search and give the top ten best hits. So you had a question. Yeah. Uh, so you said you're using some model with seven billion parameters. Yes. Mistral. Yeah. Uh, so and that if it is seven billion, it takes fourteen uh, gig RAM or something. Is that yeah. Yeah, to load that model into memory and use it, okay. uh, because each uh, floating point is 16 bits, so it's two bytes, so two times seven. <laughs> so are there models with like which would work on let's say eight gig RAM? So you have it, in practice, this the particular model I'm using is quantized, and so they've shrunk some of those floats down to be smaller, and so it doesn't take a full 14 gigs of RAM. Okay. I've been able to run four of them in parallel on my MacBook. Um, uh, four of those embedders embedding stuff in parallel. Uh, I actually have 4,586 Bigfoot sightings and the text, and I had to summarize all these with the LLM, and they took about 90 seconds each. And so I spent two weekends running my MacBook all weekend <laughs> so, so that I could save them all to Redis and then save the Redis memory down to, to a file so that when you clone it from GitHub, you don't have to do that. <laughs> so. Yeah. If you only have eight gigs of RAM, you can use a 3B model. Yeah. And you have to quit all your programs. Right? Yeah. Quit all your programs. Yeah. yeah. It's memory intensive. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, it, you know, if I try to run more than four of them in parallel on this MacBook, then what will happen is um, it'll start swapping. And it just, it just won't go. It just, it'll just sit there, basically. It just thrash. So it is memory intensive. 7B model is something that you can run on on most laptops though, uh, not a Raspberry Pi. <laughs> so I think I'm gonna show some code because I've kind of talked about what this is, but I, I think seeing it might, might help a little bit. I, actually, I think I just showed the app because uh, I had some interesting challenges in, in this app because, uh, so I, I basically created a simple, um, well, let's go ahead and look at some code first. So I've got, here are our Bigfoot sightings all 4,586 of them. I've got them as a JSON L file here. And uh, we, we, we don't need to scroll through that. It's, it's, it's there, it's, a, it's the data. That's out there in the GitHub repo. I've got an API that I wrote. This API is written in Express and Node. So I'm bringing Express, there's cores there, got some configuration. And all this is really doing is exposing three endpoints. A search endpoint, which takes um, very, it takes what your query be, that'd be sh uh, show me sightings near a body of water at night with alcohol involved. <laughs> and it'll find those, right? And you can do other discrete parameters like in the state of Ohio, 
the Redis has this search capability where you can just do a filtered search. So I can say, just give me all the Bitcoin sightings for the state of Ohio that's happened between the state and the state, for example. And then I can apply the semantic search using vectors on top of that and then filter them down further. So I can pre-filter them before I hand it off to the vector search. And so the search function supports all that. My application doesn't use all that, but the, uh, the, the function, the, the endpoint here I wrote does support that. Um, I've got a load method. What the load uh, um, endpoint does is you give it the data in a Bigfoot sighting, it writes it to Redis, and then it kicks off the embedding. Now the uh, summarization embedding is slow. Mostly the summarization is slow. And so the summarization has to go through, uh, I drop uh, that information on a queue. On a, uh, in a, Redis has the data structure for an event stream. It's probably Kafka light. Uh, and that event stream, I drop it on there and then the I have another process that will monitor that and pick up things and process them and update them as they come by. And I'll show you that in a bit. And then we've got a fetch which just fetches a big signing by its ID, which is the least interesting of them all. So um, I've built these three endpoints. We'll go into the code behind them in a minute, but I just kind of want to set the, uh, the, the lay of the land here. The, um, actually, let's go, ahead, let's go ahead and look at the, the load. So if we go into main.js, here is, so here's save, which is what load calls. So uh, this is just receiving a JSON document that contains all the Bigfoot information. Um, I got a little function there to build a key in Redis to store it in as a hash. I set the value in that hash using the hset command. If there is any, uh, um, if there is a sighting, if there's an eyewitness account, the observed field is the eyewitness account, then I will add that to a stream using the xadd command and then we'll return. And if there wasn't, then we don't. And this is all this does. This is actually really simple. It executes two REST commands. And then uh, over here in the embedder, when this kicks off, it will wait for, wait for us to be ready. And then it'll just loop forever and um, sit at the end of that, uh, go to that queue and say, is there any unprocessed events in here? And if there are, it picks, picks one of them up, it's handed one of them, and then it'll process it, and then it'll mark it as a process when it's done, and then it'll grab another and another and another until there's nothing there. And so uh, I designed it this way specifically so you can run these in parallel. So if you run four of these in parallel, it'll pick up four of them, they'll do their thing. As soon as it's done, it'll mark it as processed, and, it, and then it'll pull another one. So you can fan out the embedding. Uh, and you could actually do this uh, with this architecture across multiple machines, uh, just not. Uh, your Redis could be remote, and then these embedders could be remote as well. But uh, it's all it all runs on my MacBook. So, um, and we'll run the embedder here in a bit. Um, the fetch is uninteresting. I'm not going to go into that because it's really just calling H get all on Redis with an ID. And returning it as a JSON document. There's really not much going on there. Um, but the uh, the search is interesting, so we should take a look at the search. Let's go ahead and I don't need this. There we go. So the search command takes the query. This is the this is what you type in. Bigfoot sightings near a body of water at night. Uh, and I will build up the search query string. So if you pass in some parameters here, this would be like state is equal to Ohio, county is equal to, uh, let's go with um, Hocking County. That seems like a good place we might find Bigfoot. Um, uh, classification is another thing you can pass in. Bigfoot sightings have three classifications. Uh, you know how UFO it has like close encounters of the first, second, third kind? The Bigfoot has class A, class B, and class C Bigfoot sightings. A class A is, I saw Bigfoot. There he was, I almost got a photo. Um, but it was blurry, damn it. Why is it always blurry? Um, class B is is evidence of Bigfoot. So like I heard noises, but I didn't see Bigfoot. I don't know how anyone knows what Bigfoot sounds like. But. <laughs> um, or um, footprints, bits of fur, that kind of stuff. 
And uh, Class C, which is my favorite, which is someone told me they saw Bigfoot. It's the most reliable of all of them. Um, and there's there's like a bunch of weather data in here. So I, I, I've coded high temperature, and I, I added a uh, a query here for latitude and longitude, so you can do like a geo radius. So give me all the Bigfoot sightings within 50 miles of Cincinnati. So it'll filter on all these things that I provided. And all I'm doing here is I'm just building up a query string and saying, well, if we if state was provided, then add it, and if county is provided, then add it, and stacking it together. This is totally uh, susceptible to an injection attack, so you know, your mileage may vary. Mm -hmm. um, and then if nothing got put in that query, then we, we just make a star, which means return everything. That's, this is taking advantage of sort of the more conventional Redis search capability of just searching for things in your Redis database in general. Then uh, I build my vector query. And the vector query is, um, um, you, you provide an algorithm here. We're going to use K nearest neighbors. We give it a count, which is interpolated here. This is just the number of things I want you to return. Uh, then we have a field called at embedding, which is just, um, this corresponds to uh, the field name that's going to be in Redis, and a blob, dollar blob, which is the value that we're going to pass in later. So then I build this query up, there's that dollar blobs there. When I call um, search down here, um, this that there, that blob there, corresponds to this dollar blob here. So, so this is my query. Now I need the bytes that are going to be actually the, the actual query arguments that I put in. And so I um, fetch an embedding model, and I call embed query on that model. We'll go into how that, that looks in a moment. And then I've got this really annoying line of code here. So I call buffer.from, load32array.from embedding.buffer. So what this is doing is saying, take uh, what this model returned, the embedding it returned, which is a, an array of 32-bit float, floats. And take that array and turn it into a buffer, in other words, a byte array. However, this is a JavaScript buffer and not a node buffer. <laughs> so then I have to take this byte array and then put it into a node buffer using buffer.from so that uh, node Redis and then node.js can deal with that buffer. So this is kind of a goofy line of code here. It's like, when you turn it into a buffer, why are you turn it into a buffer again? Yo, dog, I heard you like buffers. Um, but the, the main thing here is, is then you get these bytes here in a buffer type that Node will be happy with, and then you pass that in there as the, uh, the, the array there. So then, um, then we call, uh, we call uh, search, get search results, and then we just get the values of the results and return them. Um, this is a lot of gnarly code. It's really not that gnarly, but it's, you know, if you're not doing JavaScript every day, you might be wondering what the hell's going on here. Um, and we can go into as much detail as you want with it, but I also don't want to spend all night here on, uh, boring you to death with it. Uh, I do want to show uh, how we get the model here. So I've got this fetch embedding model. And over here in models, I've got a little function here called fetch embedding model. And all it does is it creates a hugging face transformers embedding, which is part of Langchain.js. And I give it a model name. And this particular uh, library, this particular plugin for uh, Langchain, if you give it a um, model name that's on Hugging Face, it will download it for you. If you don't know what Hugging Face is, and it's just something you hear AI people talk about, you think of Hugging Face as GitHub for models. It's just a big place where everyone's putting their models up there and you can download them and use them. That's all it is. And so this particular library will download it for you. Uh, I've got this uh, kind of odd code here where I'm, you can cache bust the uh, the embedding. <laughs> um, and that's because um, it doesn't happen with this particular one, but uh, the LLM that I'm using, the Mistral 7B, with uh, I'm using Node Lama CPP, which is another uh, tool for um, Langchain.js. Node Lama CPP, will, uh, you can bring that model up, Ask it to, to summarize, ask it to summarize, ask it to summarize, and then eventually it'll crash with an error. And if you tear it down and rebuild it, it's happy again for a while. And so, total hack. 
<laughs> uh, but it's what I needed to do to make it work. That, that this could have been fixed since the time I wrote this. So I, I, can, I can show that code over here. If I, I go to models.js in the embedder, uh, I've got a summarization model and an embedding model. The summarization model, um, you know, can be, can be hash busted. Um, and if we go into embed here, oh yeah, here, here, here's the fun bit, so the, the embedder. So this is where I'm talking to an LLM and actually telling it to do stuff. So um, I'm telling Mistral 7B, you are a helpful assistant who summarizes accounts of Bigfoot sightings. These summaries will be used to generate embeddings for the sightings so that they can be searched using vector search. You will be given an account of a Bigfoot sighting and you will summarize it using no more than 512 words. You will only return the summary and nothing more. You will never return more than 512 words. <laughs> I had to tell it twice because it was still doing it occasionally. <laughs> um, and then so, uh, so then I wrote a little summarize function here. It takes text out of that JSON document, actually out of the stream in, in Redis, and it will try to summarize it. And if it fails, it will catch an error and try to summarize it and pass in true to a cache bust. <laughs> and then here is where it calls try to summarize. It's using a chat prompt template from uh, Langchain. And uh, I give it the instruction template and the citing template. So it's basically handed these instructions. And then the citing template has got curly braces, which means that that's an interpolated value. So when I call this citing template and I um, invoke it, then that, the value that's inciting here will be shoved in there. So basically I'm saying, you, you're helpful, you summarize. Here's the thing that summarizes. I could do something like, uh, please, Summarize this, right? It's just string interpolation. So that's all that's happening there. So it was a lot of talk about a lot of code in a slightly disorganized fashion. Hopefully you all are following along. Um, I think I want to just run this so we can see it. Would you like to see it actually do something? I've talked a lot, shown a little bit of code. Let's do, um, so in here, we'll do a Docker compose. This will launch Redis. This will launch, um, um, well, let's look at the Docker compose file and see all the things that will launch. This will launch, um, yeah. So it'll launch Redis here using Redis stack server. So uh, Redis stack server is Redis that you've probably, if you've used it before, with uh, the Redis search and uh, a whole bunch of other extensions. Uh, Redis search is the one we're using here uh, that allows you to do the vector search. Um, it's as free as Redis is. So, um, and we've got our API here, which is just that, the code we're just looking at. The embedder is commented out because uh, when I try and run it inside of a Docker image on my MacBook, it just doesn't do it. So, and then I got a little web UI uh, that I wrote uh, using, um, I used lit and, um, and tailwind CSS, which don't do that. <laughs> um, if you're familiar with tailwind CSS, there's a good chance you probably are. Um, it's, it's a nice CSS framework. It, it makes everything pretty, kind of reminds me a little bit of a bootstrap. Some people don't like it, but it does make things look pretty. And I'm not a designer, I'm a developer, so I needed something to make things look pretty. Lit is a JavaScript framework for building web components. And web components have a shadow DOM. And the shadow DOM is great, except uh, the shadow DOM keeps any CSS from trickling down from the top to the lower levels, which Tailwind wants to do. So I had to do a hack in my Lit code to break the shadow DOM so the Tailwind would work. Do not recommend. <laughs> But it looks fabulous. <laughs> so we should be running now. Uh, server running on port 80. That's actually a lie. It's not. It's running on port 8080. But Docker thinks it's running on port 80. So let's go ahead and bring up uh, localhost 8080. There we go. We'll big in that a bit. So this is the Bigfoot finder. What kind of Bigfoot site should we look for? Okay, um, um, be more semantic. 
<laughs> Holmes County. I was thinking more uh, involving uh, intoxicants. Mm -hmm. I, I like using these sorts of searches because it understands what an intoxicant is, and then it will pick up drugs and alcohol. <laughs> because it understands the semantics. The word intoxicant doesn't show up anywhere, but it'll figure it out anyhow. Let's hit an enter there. So we get um, so we get report four seven eight zero. Young men see a, sees see apostrophe s a huge hairy ape looking thing under a bridge. A witness reports an encounter with a large hairy creature while walking home near a bridge. There's a splash. Um, okay, it doesn't say there. Let's go ahead and click on it and see what it says. So this is the uh, all the data. So we got the date this happened. This happened July 18th, 20, 2002. Class A, meaning they saw Bigfoot. Uh, despite the belief in the camp uh, of the encounter, their mother dismissed it as drug use. <laughs> Since then, the witness has avoided crossing the bridge at night due to fear of the creature. They urged others to take account seriously. So this is the summarization. This is what the uh, Mr. 7B model running locally on my MacBook generated. It generated that summary. It reads really well. Um, this is the actual eyewitness account down here. Um, I, I like that they uh, uh, that they they decided to censor themselves. <laughs> 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 I didn't know that was in there. But, um, there's uh, the data is fun. It's got like a location here. This is just the area around which this actually is in Ohio in Hardin County, Ohio. Um, the coordinates, I actually got a little link here, so if we want to see where on the map that's at. It's uh, over on the Scioto in Kenton. Okay. And then I've got all the weather information here as well. I, I'm embarrassed to admit how much time I spent making the weather information look nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it looks nice. <laughs> I'm really happy with it. Um, Let's see if the other ones uh, picked up on that same context. The, the 512 limit is for the classification or for the first one? What's that? 512 classification of the whole or for the first para? For the, 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 for the um, just this bit here. Okay. So uh, we handed uh, all of this to the LLM and said, summarize this in 512 words or less. And it created this. There's no images, right? No, no, no images. Makes this much easier problem. Right, right. <laughs> Is this, uh, a, is this a database, like a public database of, of sightings? Uh, it's a public data set. Yeah. Uh, there's, it, it actually, uh, so there's a fun story where this data comes from. So there's this guy named Tim Renner uh, who um, likes weird data. He's based down in Texas. And he um, he's a data scientist. And so he screen scrapes all these like weird sites for their data and then does data science on them to see what he can learn, right? And so he screen scraped like uh, the uh, New Forks which is the National UFO Research Center uh, data set, all 112,092 UFO sightings and built a massive CSV file out of them. And um, then proceeded to do some analysis on it. He did a basic statistical analysis on it. Found out that, for example, uh, the majority, uh, like 80% of UFO sightings happen within 80, within 50 miles of the US Air Force Base. <laughs> wow. Shocking, right? <laughs> um, and he found out that the most common day for uh, UFO sightings, any guesses? At night. Fourth of July. <laughs> Independence Day. Yeah. Uh, the next common, most common was actually uh, New Year's Eve. So, um, so he did some basic analysis like that. For the Bigfoot sightings, he, uh, he it was it's, it's really funny, actually. He's like, he's trying to figure out where Bigfoot sightings tend to happen. Like he's trying to find Bigfoot, and so he, each of these Bigfoot sightings has, or most of them have, a, uh, a latitude and longitude. So he's like, okay, well let's let's just plot these out on a map, and do a simple clustering algorithm to see where they're grouped. And he learned that they tend to be grouped in sort of arbitrary areas until he overlaid a vegetation map, and then learned that you could find Bigfoot in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> Who'd have thunk it? So. Um, but yeah, so he screen scraped the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization's website to generate these uh, this data set. And then uh, I have then converted this to a JSONL file and I've got it in the repo. And, so um, if you had to parameterize instead of Bigfoot with the, you know, 
with the alien space suits. How would you? I, I actually you. did that in comparison just to see how the Bigfoot and aliens stuff lined up. And um, there wasn't as much pattern as you would think there. Um, the Bigfoot sightings were fun because they started out sort of slow. And then in the 70s, late 70s, there's a peak, which I credit to the $6 million man, if uh, anyone's old enough to remember that. Uh, I know Chris is nodding. <laughs> um, so back, back, back in the 70s, the, uh, there was the $6 million man had some episodes with uh, Bigfoot in them that were very popular. Uh, fun fact, Bigfoot was played by Andre the Giant. Um, and then in the 80s, they sort of taper off. But then in the mid-90s, uh, the sightings start raising dramatically. And um, that happened to be when the X-Files started. And so I like to think that that's why. Um, but, but it's really not, because that is also when the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization was founded. And so all their data is going to be, most of their data is going to be from after their founding going forward. And uh, it tapers off around 2008, which is pretty much when everyone and their brother was using nothing but a smartphone. You know, once I had a, had a high quality camera in my pocket, I could tell my story about Bigfoot, but it'd be like, bro, Pixar didn't happen. <laughs> and so they, they tend to drop off after that. Um, I like to think that that's actually when the X-Files went off the air, because it is. And so there is a fun correlation there. Um, the 70s, in all, in all honesty, I think the reason there was a spike in Bigfoot sightings in the 70s, it could have just been drugs. <laughs> that's very plausible, but... But it, it sort of matches the spirit of the age of the 70s. Uh, there was like just sort of an interest in the paranormal at the time. And so people were looking for it. Um, I, I've done some other analysis on the Bigfoot data. And actually, the sightings tend to just happen when people are in the woods, which is all you really get out of the data. Like there's more Bigfoot sightings in the summer than there are in the winter. This isn't because Bigfoot hibernates. It's because people camp in the summer. Uh, you see more Bigfoot sightings on the weekends most on Saturday, because that's when people are always camping for the weekend, not at home, not hunched over their computers, slaved, uh, slaved to the, the machines writing code. Um, you see uh, more Bigfoot sightings in October, which is when the trees, uh, when there are more people hunting, because that's hunting season. So it, it actually tells us more about human activity than it does about Bigfoot. Uh, but the data, it's, it's a ton of fun. Um, does this one have anything to do with drugs or intoxicants? Um, it does not. It does have a fear of ridicule here. It's possible that not many of them reference drugs, and so it will do its best match and give us the top ten. Let's let's do something um, uh, in the desert. Can you say like not in the woods? Yes, you can. Not in a forest. It understands. Not in a forest. Now, <laughs> for the record, this is because of the models and not because of rats. <laughs> um, it should understand that. Not near trees. Let's try that. Yeah, it's, it's fixating on the word trees. Yeah, it's not even the not. Maybe try cactus. Cacti? Uh, let's, let's do in the desert. Well, a place called White Sulphur Springs is probably in the desert. <laughs> um, Seems like it's uh, fixate on trees. Yeah, it really is fixate. Well, I mean, a lot of these, a lot of the, um, a lot of the sightings are in forests. It tends to be where Bigfoot sightings. Um, this did better before I had more data. <laughs> I mean, is there like anything about what beaches possibly? Oh, that's a fun one. Uh, uh, near the beach. Uh, Shell Island Beach during a boat ride. Storm watchers and towers observe animal on beach. Uh, This one may not be a beach here, but yeah. So overall, it does a fair job. Is the query based on single words when you put in the 
sentence or is it on the whole query itself? It's on the whole query. So what it's doing is when I type this query in, it's creating an embedding off of the query. And then it's comparing that embedding against the other embeddings in Redis, which is actually kind of cool. Um, and uh, of course, it's only going to be as good as the embeddings. Um, Redis can't do anything about that. Uh, if, if your embedding, embeddings aren't great, then then it's you know you're not going to get good comparisons. Um, this is this is the gist of what it does. I think uh, I want I want to show. Um, uh, let's do near a body of water at night. So that should that should get several hits. Um, yeah, here. So R and I had been fishing. Um, it, it's interesting. Every now and then, it will. Uh, it, usually, it summarizes and puts it in third person, but every now and then it won't. R and I had been fishing in the duck ponds when a darkness on as darkness really heard splashing in a large pond to the west of the gravel road. Upon investigation, we found a creature chest deep in the water, slapping the surface. The size and depth of the water suggested this was not a human, but a much larger entity. Excited, we shared a discovery with nearby friends. That sounds like near body water at night. For the evening, uh, Lake Michigan, okay, this sounds like it's near body water. So it, 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 it knows that a body of water includes things like lakes and creeks and streams and ponds. It understands that when you say it's as it was getting dark, that that means it was not at night. So it, it is pulling the context and the semantics out of what it's asking for. Um, I think some of the words it, it's struggling with a little bit more than others. Um, I'm going to go ahead and attempt. Let's let's run it in better. And this one, I'm just going to do an NPM start on. Okay, and it's just sitting there. And then I should be able to terminal. It can be a new terminal. So I want to do a new terminal like that. And now I got to see if I can remember the curl command. <laughs> I don't have to because I've got a curl command in here. And we're going to go ahead and shove one in there. We'll use this one here. I saw a, wall, a Bigfoot at Walmart buying flip flops. Apparently, he wears a size 17. <laughs> so I'm going to copy this here. Paste that into here, and we'll see if that works. So I've added big, assigning 65535 to the backlog for summarization. So if we see here, um, the model has uh, picked up, uh, has grabbed something here. If we go into Redis, to that local one. We can see, uh, let's look for our stream. There's a stream. There is, I saw Bigfoot at Walmart buying, uh, buying flip-flops. Apparently he wears a size 17. So that's in there. There's the ID. There's the observed. The model is summarizing this as we speak. It'll take a little bit. If I go into uh, all the hashes and look for 65535, Bigfoot colon sighting colon there. So you can see that the hash has been populated. Uh, it's, it's created the embedding already. Um, so this might be old actually. There's Athens, Ohio. There's the embedding. Uh, and then here's the summary that it created. In this account, a witness reported an unusual encounter at their local Walmart. They claimed to have seen Bigfoot, a legendary creature often described as a large hairy humanoid purchasing flip flops. The size of the foot figure suggested, suggested that Bigfoot had an unusually large shoe size, estimated to be 17. The sighting is intriguing due to its unexpected setting and the potential implications for understanding the habits or needs of this elusive creature. This is what the Mistral 7D model came up with from, <laughs> from, um, from I saw Bigfoot at the Walmart buying flip flops. <laughs> uh, this is why it reads like someone it's inflating it, right? It's kind of fun. Um, and it, it actually, it did finish, so the embedding was created. 
So here it is a processed event and acknowledge that event. This this ID right there should correspond to this ID right. Now. Go back to the IDs right. ID well, is correct. Uh, the, the ID is six five five three five. The, uh, the event stream itself has a uh, an ID associated with it as well for the entry. So if I, um, now, so um, yeah, so that's one seven one two that dash zero. That corresponds to this ID here. So it processed that event and then acknowledged that it's been processed. So. Redis Streams has a whole consumer groups model where you can create a consumer group and say a, a, a series of uh, processes can go out and grab events off the stream, process them, acknowledge them, and then only one will be able to grab them. Going into the details, that's beyond the scope of the topic, but uh, that's what's happening here. That's how I'm, I could run like 10 of these in parallel if I wanted. I did summarize it pretty quickly though, so I'm happy with that. So yeah. So now in your Bigfoot Finder, can you say shopping? Uh, let's try that. Shopping. Um, shopping for flip flops. <laughs> there we go. Totally worked. Let's see, how else could we don't, have? Don't use flip flops, okay. use a different. Shopping. Shoes or for footwear. footwear. Yeah. There we go. It, it still found it. Cool. <clears throat> um, let's do a search for Walmart. Uh, it does find the, the Walmart there. Um, although it's not the number one hit. You do like big box store or just large retail store or something. Or what if you just said Target and then somehow it associated target to nice. it's shopping at large retailer <laughs> it's still found Walmart yeah can you try target shopping at target and see if it associates that with it did not Walmart yeah Maybe shopping target to store capital T uh it might yeah shopping well dang that's cool yeah uh, I'm trying to think of, 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 a, of a, uh, it could be cool if you get like a similar vector, like that's shoe shopping nearby. <laughs> Good Buying merchandise. Did I spell merchandise right? Close enough. It was the second one. I wonder what this one is here. Business shares account of a mysterious encounter while on his way to duck hunting. Uh, so the, so, the, so the, uh, the businessman was, was going on shopping. <laughs> but yeah, um, that's pretty much what I got. Uh, I built a stupid thing, but, and you know, this may seem like a stupid thing to build, right? We, we don't need to search for Bigfoot semantically, but, and I, I, this is the relevant part, is that this is, this is relevant to other things that you might do. And you can search for other things than Bigfoot using this, these same patterns. Um, don't need a credit card. Don't have to do it in Python. You can run it all locally. Um, and you can you can clone this code down today, uh, install node if you want to live your life that way, and run this tonight. Um, and you know, my goal with this was to try to make this accessible. Uh, one of the things that I, I, I do want to stress I should have brought this up at the beginning, but I, I'm just remembering it now, so I'm going to bring it up now. Is that um, as a developer, there's a sense that we have to understand how all these things work on the inside. We don't. I mean, we, ha we need to have what I call the mechanics understanding of an engine, not an engineer's understanding of an engine. My mechanic understands that the pistons go up and down and how all that works, and he can work with it, and he can repair it, he can hook it up to things, and he can make it do stuff. But he's not going to sit there and design. A VA. That's not what a mechanic does. When it comes to this AI, we as developers, we're the mechanics. We're going to use these things. We're going to build it and incorporate the things. Most of us aren't going to go inside the models. And so we can use these and have a basic understanding of how they operate and build powerful applications without necessarily having to become data scientists. 
Because I think that's that's a fear a lot of us have is like, I need to learn data science because otherwise I'm going to be left behind. No, you're not. None of us are. None of us in here are data scientists. Well, maybe some of you are. I'm not. I, I don't want to be a data scientist. I don't want to do all that calculus. <laughs> I don't want to do all the statistics. Um, I just want to use these things to build cool, cool thing, uh, cool. Use these tools to build cool things. And a lot of what we're seeing and what we're doing right now is we're really just taking these models that others have built, and we're chaining them together to build applications. That's what I did here. I take the Bigfoot sighting. I feed it into a model that summarizes it, and then I feed that output into a model that creates an embedding, and then I can then use that to search. I could create more complex patterns than that, rather than just summarizing and embedding. Uh, there's lots of other patterns that you've probably heard the buzzwords around. You've probably heard semantic caching. Semantic caching is the idea that I search for something with some keywords, and then I get results. And so you create an embedding of my query, and then store the results that I'm caching along with that embedding. And then if someone has a similar query, we create the embedding and look for matching queries and then matching results first before we hit anything else. So we can get we can cache things that are similar without having the exact same keywords. So I, I could take this Bigfoot setting here and do a semantic caching as well. Like you have a much larger Bigfoot setting. Uh, there's uh, RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation. That's a, a big buzzword right now. This is chaining together LLMs to do things. In RAG, someone types in a query, and then you turn that query into an embedding, and then you go find documentation that in your database that matches the context, the semantics of what they're looking for. And then you take that documentation, and you hand it to an LLM and say, hey, LLM, um, here's a bunch of background information. Here's what someone asked. Answer the question given the background information. And so this effectively allows someone to retrieve arbitrary documentation semantically from your database and then answer questions in the context of that documentation. And so, and you're chaining these commands together. That's why it's called LangChain. <laughs> uh, I, I, there needs to be a LangChain for J. I don't know if there is one yet. Is there one? Yeah. Is there? Okay. Uh, well, good. There should be. Oh, you mean for, for Java? For Java, oh, yeah, like spring, a link chain for J. Spring AI. Yeah, it's Spring AI, yeah. yeah. Spring AI is solving that, that problem. But but the idea is that you can compose these as components in your system. And um, I actually, uh, there was an expression at the beginning here, a concern about, is this going to take my job? I do not think this is going to take our jobs. I think that we have, in my career, I've had two good waves to ride. And I think this is the third one. The first wave was in the mid 90s when the internet happened. I graduated from college, got a job, and a couple of years later, everyone needed a website, but they didn't know why. And so they hired a bunch of web devs to build websites. And they needed more developers than they needed before because you still had all the existing applications that everyone was using for everything else. So the need for developers grew. Around 2008 ish, 9 ish, around that cell phone revolution, all of a sudden, We've got all these web apps, we've got all these existing production apps, but now we need all these mobile apps. But we need even more developers to build all these mobile apps for everyone. And these are, these are big sea changes that happened in software in the software field. AI is the next one. We've got all these AI models, and everyone wants to put AI into their application to make them smarter and faster, mostly smarter. <laughs> um, and so they're going to hire. They're, there's going to be a demand, and we're not. It hasn't got over the curve yet, but I think we're on the cusp of getting that next big change. And we're going to need a whole bunch of developers that existing in addition to the existing web apps and the existing mobile apps and the existing just enterprise apps. Now we're going to need all these AI and power powered apps. And so it's going to I think we're going to have another big boom here uh, that I'm hoping to ride into retirement. <laughs> so uh, that's my little pep talk to say fear not. I think the AI and once AI gets smart enough to do all the things that humans do, then, then we're all screwed. But until then, enjoy the ride. You'll be retired, and then they'll be taking care of you. Exactly. Well, I can imagine a future where you have an, uh, an LLM programmed robot. If anyone's seen like the figure one, it's pretty impressive. If I could get a robot that walked around my house and did all the things that I didn't want to do and was fairly reasonably, like, was as smart as a 12-year-old, uh, which well, I've had 12-year-olds. <laughs> They're actually smarter than 14-year-olds, now that I think about it. <laughs> um, 
But if you could have, I mean, if you could have a, a, an AI bot that could walk around your house and was as smart as a five-year-old, um, I'd pay, and it would cost like $20,000, would you buy it? Probably would. Think of all the things, it's like, no, I don't want to do laundry. Cutting <laughs> the grass. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could just do all those things that you don't want to do. People are going to totally buy them. And once that happens, then, you know, then all of our economic, economic bottles break and we don't know what's going to happen. But until then, enjoy the ride. <laughs> so, how's that for our weird pep talk? <laughs> so, uh, any questions? Yeah. How does this search? Related to or hooked up to the Reddit search. Are you connecting them together or? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I've got literally what's happening when I, I type in here, when I, I type in the query, uh, I hit that search endpoint in, in Express. Right. Okay. And then it's building that query um, and it's taking that string and then creating the embedding on that string and passing that in as part of the query. In this particular case, uh, I'm not putting in like state Ohio or anything like that because I haven't coded that into the UI. And so it's going through all that code and saying, well, is there a state? No. Is there a county? No. So none of the discrete, discrete parameters are there. But the general query, the, the semantic query is, and so then it turns that into an embedding and then passes that in along with the star. So if we go back to the code here and look at, um, Um, main.js. We'll go ahead and shrink that down. Hey, what's happening is, is basically this query right there is what I'm typing into that form. Uh, parameters is an empty object, and count is uh, hard coded to ten. And um, and then here I'm, I'm going through and saying, well, are there any params? Well, no, it's an empty object, so nothing nothing happens there. So none of these get populated, and so I just pass in star. And so my query ends up being pretty much this right there. And so I'm just doing a pure embedding search. Now, uh, you know, and a nice thing to add to this would be like a little drop down here for an advanced search, and then you could, you know, select states and counties and that kind of stuff. Um, I just didn't do that. I went, I, I'm going to say that uh, I was totally, totally not that I wasn't too busy, totally wasn't that I was lazy. It's totally an exercise that uh, someone who takes this code base needs to do to uh, learn this stuff better. <laughs> So, um, an opportunity to play with the code base, but yeah. So that's how this GUI translates to that. And then, uh, honestly, this here is just a straight up. Um, that's just going to fetch, just pulling the data straight out of Redis. That's, that's this. That one's real simple. Other questions? Is no, that is there like a way? To... Hang on, hang on, Steve. Now, but is there like a way uh, to be able to look at uh, through like the dates, uh, be able to kind of like map out uh, like uh, through all the sightings uh, to see like where the pattern is of what uh, like Bigfoot's traveling? Like, uh, so the Redis search will allow you to search on dates as well. They just treat dates as numbers. So, uh, so like, uh, would be able to like help uh, like search as far as also figuring out where the migration patterns of where Bigfoot uh, goes, like between like. Say, like, going from, like, Ohio to California to, like, I, I don't know, like, uh, uh, Georgia. Um, I mean, you could certainly do that with the data. Uh, you could craft any query you want. Uh, so you can do dates. You can look at uh, the Redis search itself supports uh, numeric, which can be treated as dates or as just numbers. Um, their store is uh, epoch seconds. Uh, so, um, you know, number of seconds since 1970. Um, you can do uh, geographical searches and say, give me all these things within a radius, uh, you know, 50 miles of this location or 1,000 feet of this location. Uh, you can do tag queries where you're looking for just text values that are discrete, so like zip code maybe or classification. It does support full text search in that elastic sort of way. So you can do like just give me all the big list items that have the word um, Amish in them. Yes, there are some that have the word Amish in them. <laughs> um, and uh, or has Amish and Walmart, right? Um, which is also one of them. <laughs> um, and it's smart enough to know how to do stemming on those. And so if you look for, you know, 
water or waters, it understands that waters is plural for water and it picks the same word and it ignores like common words. That's not. So, so do full text search as well. And so it, you can do all of those searches and you can do the vector similarity to do to get that semantic search. So it's a pretty capable search engine. Um, internally, this is all just stored as hashes in Redis. Um, you can also store it as JSON documents as, if you like. Hashes are a little more efficient right now for the embeds. Uh, the JSON ends up storing the embeddings as an array of bytes, I believe. Whereas if you do it as a hash, it's stored as a protobuf. So it's more compact. Yeah. If I were to refactor this app into fight in a general sighting, like alien sighting, yeah. or uh, coyote sighting, or something like that, how would I, how would, what are the things I need to take care of? Uh, you, of course, you need to adjust all the fields and stuff for the different fields that you might have and the types and stuff. Uh, the main thing you'd have to do is you'd have to tell the LLM that summarizes it that it's doing something different. <laughs> okay. You'd say you're a helpful assistant that uh, summarizes UFO sightings. <laughs> but otherwise, it would be a very similar application. Steve, you had a question. I was wondering, for the count that you return, that's just the limit, but are, are the results weighted at all as far as best or? Yeah, the, the, the results are weighted. And um, and um, I actually, there's a specific thing I had to do in the code to make sure it, or it sorted it on the correct weighting. So in the uh, query here, um, I do sort by embedding score right here. And then that's one of the things I returned. So if we look at the JSON that comes back, the embedding score will be in there. So there, there is a, a weighted score in there. Um, Redis uh, search itself has a weighting as well for like text search and stuff like that. For full text search, it will be weighted as well. If you don't specify the sort by here, it will use that one instead, which was very confusing the first time I did it wrong. Uh, so in this case, but yeah, there's an embedding score. I could return both of those scores if I wanted. I just don't want to. Mm -hmm. um, so would you do things in the application like if if location is specified, then that increases your the weighting for that result? If there's a match now that doesn't work, that doesn't work super well with the way Redis search works, because Redis search is doing a, a filtered query, not a there's two terms where I can't remember the exact terms, but they basically what Redis is doing behind the scenes is this bit here inside this query, so the, the search query inside of the parentheses is filtered, is run first. Then uh, the results of that are fed into vector search. And so it's a filtered query, not a hybrid query. Okay. So hybrid query would take all of those into account and balance those out, which would be more powerful. Um, Redis uh, search doesn't do that yet. That is in the works. And so uh, the search query itself is going to then be weighted. Uh, it, it will naturally weight against the score. And so it'll, it, it'll say, give me give me the top whatever that matched this, and then run those through uh, the uh, through the vector search and give me the top 10 of those. I'm not, I don't think, uh, because this count is part of the um, vector query, and it's not part of the search query here, um, I believe it's actually going through the entire index, probably up to its limit, uh, which I think is like a thousand or something like that, uh, and then uh, doing the vector query. But I, I could be wrong on all those numbers, so don't quote me on them. I'd have to read the documentation to be sure. And, and all those things are configurable for us as well. So, cool. Uh, we we want to do the hybrid query because that that creates better results. Uh, but right now it's just a filter query. How is the filter? Like like a like what params is it used to filter? Yeah, it, it literally uh, the filter is whatever I queried here in this search query here, which is like state, Ohio, county, okay. Franklin, those sorts of things. And so it'll filter all the data for that first, and then we'll take those results and then do a ah, I see. yeah, think like a where clause. It'd be yeah. cool if it was like but dynamic, or like like the right. uh, well, well, model you, could could. Right. Dynamically, like how he was saying, like the migrations over time, where it could like kind of do something. Well, and the other thing you could do with this is you could take a lot of this data, which I have just treated as fields, and you could put that data into the embedding. Oh, really? And then it would have more information it could operate on. Now it's going to be a little, you know, 
Lucy, like it doesn't really do good. Like I'll ask you to say, give me Bigfoot sightings in Ohio, just from the search thing. And it it's not really good at geography. It doesn't, the, the, the Mistral 70 model doesn't seem to know its geography very well. So it doesn't know that this place is in Ohio, even though it might mention a place name in the sighting. And, um, and so it doesn't seem to be very good at that. I suspect a smarter model would probably be able to do better with that. Other questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, that is the most important thing. So if you go to, this is the problem of not having slides. <laughs> so if we go to github.com slash, we'll, we'll uh, go off of, um, we'll go off of mine. Guy Roy slash, this is the repo. I'm going to dig in this so that you can see it. Finding Bigfoot with semantic search. But you have a lot of repos. I, I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, whenever I got a pet project, I just put it out there and poke around. If I do a kata, I just do it out there and I leave it out there. Uh, I, actually, this is the original URL, uh, but I since I, I moved it over to our Redis developer organization, and then I forked it over here just so that uh, if people come to my GitHub, they'll still find it. So either of those work. I think that's uh, I think that's probably a good point. What you call it? Thanks, Jack. Apologize for being a little uh, little bouncy at the beginning there. Uh, not a very rehearsed talk yet. <laughs>